From stories across the globe to stories here at home, this is the National News Broadcast. A very good evening to you. I'm Sharifa Tahe. A very good evening indeed. I'm Charita Minipurarachi. And now let's move on to the headlines for tonight's news. Government issues that no shortage prevails over essential food items. A paddy stock illegally stored away in Ampara has been recovered. Government prepares to distribute relevant organic fertilizer quantities required for Maha season without any shortage. A COVID-19 vaccination program for the persons between 20 and 30 years of age. A maximum price rate of 3,000 rupees for an oximeter. We move on to those and other stories in detail now. The government emphasizes that the reports over an alleged essential food shortage, including rice and sugar, in the country are baseless. Issuing a statement, the Department of Government Information has pointed out that the government possess adequate quantities of food items to fulfill the public demand. Baseless reports have been circulating on certain local and international media platforms as well as social media, claiming that the country is facing a severe food shortage at present. The Department of Government Information has said that certain opposition politicians have been promoting these baseless reports continuously. The statement has further indicated that information has been received on the alleged attempts made by certain deceptive traders have concealed essential food items including rice and sugar with the intention to make hefty profits. In the effort to thwart these efforts, emergency regulations were formulated on essential food supply under the Public Security Ordinance with effect from last Monday. The aim of this initiative is to recover concealed food stocks and hand over such stocks to Lanka Satosa and related state institutions at fair rates. The government has requested public not to panic over such baseless reports on food shortages in the country. Another paddy stock which had been illegally stored in a warehouse was recovered by Essential Services Commissioner's Office today. The recovery was made in Ampara area. The relevant paddy stocks will be purchased through the paddy marketing board and the converted rice will be distributed among the consumers under certified price rates through Lanka Satosa and cooperative branches. Several raids were carried out in districts by a group of officers led by Essential Services Commissioner General Major General Senarath Nimunuhela. Chairman of Consumer Affairs Authority retired Major General Shantadi Sanayaka was also present for the raids. Meanwhile, officers attached to the Kurunagala District Consumer Affairs Authority recovered 165 metric tons of sugar, which had been stored away without any proper permission during a raid carried out in Uyandande area in Kurunagala today. Subsequently, steps were taken to seal the warehouse after taking over the sugar stock under the Consumer Affairs Authority. And meanwhile, the sugar stock which was sealed by the Consumer Affairs Authority and subsequently handed over to the Essential Services Commissioner General officially has been issued to the market today. The government has taken steps to distribute the sugar stock for the consumers at fair price rates to Lanka Santosa Network. Close to 3,000 metric tons of sugar were recovered during the raids carried out in five warehouses located in Muthrajavela, Vattala and Kiribadgud areas. The Consumer Affairs Authority has been given the opportunity to obtain relevant sugar stocks from Lanka Satusa outlets from today onwards. The government officials of line institutions said that the mechanism has been formulated to provide organic fertilizer required for the Maha season to the farmers without any shortage. Accordingly, they said the entire process, including farmer awareness, technical assistance and financial assistance, is being continued uninterrupted. It was also revealed that a QR code will be introduced for all imported and locally produced organic fertilizers. This was revealed at the media briefing held at the Presidential Media Center today through the WebEx application. The weekly media briefing of the Presidential Media Center was held on the use of organic fertilizer and regulation. Though the government has taken steps to manufacture local organic fertilizer, achieving the goal to manufacture the fertilizer quantity required for the farmers was hampered due to the current situation. Accordingly, it was revealed that arrangements have been made to import organic fertilizer of high international standard to address any shortage and also use biopesticides that are covered by the Pesticides Act. 
The full approval of the Fertilizer Advisory Committee has been granted in this regard. The officials also ensured that the organic fertilizers will be made available to the farmers after subjecting to laboratory and biodiversity research and testing. Financial incentives of 12,500 rupees per hectare up to a maximum of two hectares will be provided to farmers to encourage organic fertilizer production. Applications have already been issued in this regard and the officials said the completed application forms can be submitted to the Agricultural Research and Production Assistance or the Agrarian Service Centers. The farms will be credited to the personal account of the relevant farmers and plans have been made to provide financial assistance to the farmers who do not have bank accounts under a special scheme. It was also stated that farmers who do not have the facilities to produce organic fertilizer have the opportunity to obtain organic fertilizer from other parties and the money will be reimbursed to them. It was also revealed that a QR code will be issued for all imported and locally produced organic fertilizers in the future and through this facility anyone can check the quality of the organic fertilizer. It was also mentioned that the 1920 hotline said to provide solutions to farmers' problems and a team of technical officers covering all districts have been prepared for field inspections. Responding to the questions raised by the journalists on the challenges faced by the tea industry with the use of organic fertilizers. The officials said that the Tea Research Institute already examined the imported fertilizer samples and will recommend the most suitable organic fertilizer for the tea industry in the future. Responding to the questions, the public officials pointed out that a total cost of 26.62 billion rupees will be spent for the entire process, including the required fertilizers for the Maha season, local production, import subsidies, technical assistance and awareness. They also said that with this initiative, a considerable amount out of the 22.71 billion rupees spent on the importation of chemical fertilizers will remain with the farmers in the country. With the use of organic fertilizers, the country has developed a young entrepreneurship. The state banks are already in the process of granting them loans up to 1 million rupees at a concessionary interest rate, while low-income earners will be provided with necessary machinery at a concessionary price, officials pointed out this. The government officials assured that the farmers would never be isolated at any cost and further stressed that there would be no food shortage or famine risk in the country as a result of the organic fertilizer policy as claimed by some media and various groups. Dr. Ajanta de Silva, Director General of the Department of Agriculture, Commissioner General of Agrarian Services Department, HML Abe Ratna, Additional Secretary to the State Ministry of Agriculture, Mahesh Lasanta Gammampila, Dr. J.V. Hemanta Vijaywardana, Consultant Organic Fertilizer, the Ministry of Agriculture, and Dr. M. S. J. Jamuddin, Additional Director, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Development Center, joined the media conference through the WebEx application. Maha Sangha has requested the entire teacher and principal community to act flexibly considering the future generation of the country under such crisis situation. Maha Sangha has further pointed out that extending education for the students who are the future generation of the country is a responsibility vested with the entire teacher community. Deputy Chief Prelate of Malbata Chapter Venerable Dimul Kumbure Bimaladar Matera said that children are the future generation of this country. Therefore, he said that not paying attention on children can be considered as an offence. The Deputy Chief Prelate requested the teacher community to consider the future education of the children and take positive measures to re-engage in their services. Political and trade unions representatives point out that certain leaders of the Teachers Trade Unions Act, in order to fulfill their political objectives through a positive decision has been taken by the government over the issue pertaining to teacher principal salary anomalies. They made these remarks while speaking at several media briefings held in Colombo today. Chairperson of Sri Lanka Podujana Educational Services Association, Vasanta Handapanagoda, said that the government has pledged to resolve the issue pertaining to salary anomalies from January by allocating funds from the next budget. She said that the government has taken steps to provide a 5,000 rupee allowance for the teachers as well. However, she said that certain groups are continuing with the struggle without accepting the 5,000 rupee allowance, claiming that they need the implementation of the Subodhani Committee report. She pointed out the difficulty 
authorities in implementing the Subodani report, considering the prevailing economic crisis in the country. Therefore, she said that the teachers should accept the allowance and resume to do online education system for the children. Parliamentarian Professor Charita Herat said that the teachers affiliated to their party raised this issue first. The subsequently, this issue was addressed through the policy statement. He said that the trade union leaders who are raising their voice over the issue had not directed their attention in the propaganda campaigns of their relevant parties. Meanwhile, Health Ministry has said that steps have been taken to initiate vaccination programs for the persons between 20 and 30 years of age on district level. Minister Kehalia Rambukwella said that the relevant measures were taken today. The quantities of vaccines required to inoculate the persons within the age category have already been issued while vaccinating the frontline workers of the COVID prevention process. Also, the persons employed in essential sectors, including apparel sector, will also be inoculated under this program. So far, 3.7 million persons have gained eligibility to receive the vaccine under the relevant age category. The minister instructed the relevant officials to implement an accelerated vaccination program for them. This was revealed during a discussion held with the State Services United Nations Association at the Health Ministry premises today. Chairman of the Association, Venerable Murute Tue Anand Terev, is also present at this occasion. So far, 21,146,303 persons in the country have been inoculated with the vaccine doses under the COVID immunization program. 2,564,043 vaccine doses have been given to the people during the last seven days. 474,116 vaccine doses have been inoculated yesterday. The mobile vaccination program for the persons about 60 years of age and persons with special needs were also conducted in several parts of the country today. The mobile vaccination drive has been initiated in Putlam district as well. The relevant vaccination program in the district expected to be concluded in the next couple of days. Meanwhile, mobile vaccination program has also been carried out in centres of Gaul district. Accordingly, the program was carried out in Gaul, Vakwella, Kumarakanda, Hikadwe, Gonpinwala areas today. 2,773 COVID-19 patients were detected from the country today. Meanwhile, 1,952 patients left the hospitals today for loving recovery. The government has decided a maximum price rate of 3,000 rupees for an oximeter. Also, State Minister Chanajaya Sumana said that stern regulatory process should be carried out on oximeters, automatic thermometer and oxygen concentration machines. He directed instructions to relevant officials in this regard at a meeting held at the Health Ministry. The State Minister instructed the officials to take action against those who illegally bring down such substandard equipments into the country. The expert committee of the Medicine Regulatory Authority has only approved several oximeter types supplied by five suppliers. National Medicine Regulatory Authority revealed today that more than 5,000 oximeters which were brought into the country without any registration have been taken into custody. The registered supplier and their brand should be publicized through the website of the authority, State Minister Professor Jai Subana said. Army Commander General Shavendra Silva said that the integrated COVID-19 treatment, patient treatment and management system operated through 1904 SMS service has been implemented in southern province as well. A call center for Southern Province was initiated at Rohunu University today. The center was declared open with the participation of Vice Chancellor of the University, Senior Professor Sujeev Amarasena. Twenty-five families deprived of livelihood due to quarantine curfew in Arunapura village in New Hagurankata Division in Anuradhapura have requested the Divisional Secretariat to donate three two thousand rupee allowance which they have received from the government to the COVID-19 Healthcare and Social Security Fund. Accordingly, with several other donations received from another group of villagers, a total of eighty-seven thousand rupees have been deposited to the COVID-19 Healthcare and Social Security Fund as per Thalava Divisional Secretary Anuradhisanayaka.
621 persons have been taken into custody in the last 24 hours for violating the quarantine curfew today and accordingly a total of 63,331 persons have been taken into custody thus far. The distribution of various types of allowances including the senior citizens allowance was carried out today through the island-wide post office network. State Ministry of Agriculture has said that all economic centres and mining market will remain open on September 5th and 6th for the wholesale trading purposes. Meanwhile, speaking to media, Director General of Health Services Dr. Asela Gunawardana made remarks over the national vaccination drive currently underway in the country. He also made remarks on the home-based care systems introduced for the monitoring and treatment of COVID-19 infected persons. We have given 12.4 million doses as first dose, about 30 years population. And we have given 7.7 .7 million doses as second dose, about 30 years of population. So our estimated population is about 11.4 million because this was based on 2012 statistics. It is the projection of up to 2020. So there is a discrepancy between these two figures and the vaccines we have given and this number of doses includes the vaccination of people who are between 80 to 30 where we have vaccinated a lot of factory workers, other frontline workers including healthcare workers as well as triforces. Those statistics has to be excluded. Right now we are doing a survey by MOH area wise to get the exact figures which are not vaccinated so we will be starting the mopping up vaccination after completing the second dose hopefully mid-September and after completing this cohort 30 and above population we are going to start the vaccination from 18 to 30 cohort and we are expecting another 4 million of vaccination during this week and it will be distributed throughout the island as the second dose of vaccination as well as for the mopping up of where the vaccinations were not done. Our home-based care system is in full swing at this moment. We have two systems. One is 1390, which is done by Ministry of Health. And there is another system where the triaging has been done. And that is with the collaboration of Sri Lanka Medical Association and COVID-19 Task Force Centre. It is 247 and 91904. So this too has eased the congestion of the leading hospitals in Western province and because of that only the needy patients will be getting admitted to the, all these leading hospitals. This system is now in place so whoever got positive can contact the area PHI or the MOH and they will enter your details into the system then only a doctor will speak to you but that is government system and Otherwise, you can call 247 or you can send a SMS to 91904, so then they will be replying. Chairman of State Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Corporation, Dr. Prasanna Gunasena, assured that no low quality medicinal product has been manufactured by the corporation during the last 18 month period. He made these remarks in a response to the recent queries raised on the quality of this PMC manufactured medicinal products. There has been many queries about the manufacturing quality of State Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Corporation. A state Pharmaceutical Corporation, when I started functioning, we started a program of checking, randomly checking the quality of drugs that are being given to Health Ministry as well as to the Ozal Network. So now, when we tested these medications randomly, we found that about 28% of imported drugs are at a lower level of its quality. However, during the last one and a half years, when we checked state pharmaceutical corporation manufactured uh, medicines, we haven't found a single quality failure during this period. Therefore, whether it is thyroxine, whether it is tramadol, whether it is gabapentin, the manufacturing quality of state pharmaceutical corporation has been proven beyond reasonable doubt that they have been doing it up to the international standard. Therefore, please trust the manufacturing in Sri Lanka and we are trying to shift from an importing country to a manufacturing country with regard to medicine. I think Dr. Palindra Vansha is working very hard on that. We will be able to see the results within the next couple of years and you will be able to get not only medicine but surgical items also from Sri Lankan manufactured companies, state pharmaceutical manufacturing corporation as well as independent entrepreneurs in this field. 
Today marks the World Coconut Day, commemorating the International Day or First Day Car of 10 special commemorative stamps were issued at the Temple Trees today under the patronage of Prime Minister Mahinder Rajapaksha. Established in 1969, the Asia-Pacific Coconut Community declared September 2nd as the World Coconut Day while commemorating the 25th anniversary of the organization in 1998. Coconut Research Institute of Sri Lanka, established in 1929, is the sole institution in the world for the research related to coconut crop. The Coconut Research Institute has organized many events in parallel to the World Coconut Day and these initiatives will be implemented in future following the COVID-19 outbreak in the country. For the first time of the history of Sri Lanka, the Coconut Research Institute, together with the Department of Postal Services, has issued 10 special commemorative stamps at once. Deputy Postmaster General Susita Hulangamua presented the first day car and the commemorative stamp to Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha. State Minister Arundika Fernando and Chairman of Coconut Development Authority Keith Srivira Singh were present at this occasion. Meanwhile, commemorating the International Coconut Day, Rasa Masa Avalu book was launched at the Department of Government Information premises today. The book, authored by Chairperson of Coconut Plantation Authority, Malthavi Herath, was presented to State Minister Arundika Fernando at the event. This event was organized by National Media Center. The United States government has awarded a grant to conserve the 17th century Royal Palace and Archaeology Museum in Kandy. Funding for the project totals over 52 million rupees. U.S. Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation has indicated that the new project aims to conserve the old Candian King's Palace and upgrade the Archaeology Museum in the King's Palace located within the sacred temple of the Tut complex. The conservation of the important architectural, cultural and historical monuments at the UNESCO World Heritage Site is expected to provide future generations to view and continue to learn about the history of the ancient Kandy Kingdom as per the statement issued by the U.S. Embassy in Colombo. The statement has further indicated that conservation of monuments located within the religiously and historically symbolic Kandy city will also attribute to encourage tourism promote economic development, and also help preserve Sri Lanka's magnificent cultural heritage. The U.S. Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation has funded 14 projects in Sri Lanka, including the conservation of the Rajagala Buddhist Forest Monastery, the preservation of Buddhist, Hindu, and other collections in the Anuradhapura Archaeological Museum, the restoration of the Batikla Dutch Fort, and the preservation of the intangible heritage of ritual music and dance forms of the Adivasi, Tamil, and Hindu Tamil and Buddhist communities. And meanwhile, the 70th anniversary of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party falls on today. The Sri Lanka Freedom Party is considered as a party which had brought local politics to common masses. It was on the 2nd of September 1951, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party had been formulated under the leadership of S.W. R.B. Bandar Naika. The pioneering roles played by veterans of the caliber of D.A. Rajapaksha, Sri Nishadukar and Bernard Aluvihare had paved the way for the creation of this LFP. In the year 1956, the party had come into power in a massive force of power based on the five-fold forces of the Sangha Veda Guru Govi Kamkaru. Among the progressive programs of the government in 1956 included making the Sinhala language the official language of the country, upgrading Vidyode and Vidyalankara Pirivinas to the university status, nationalizing of buses and harbour. Upon untimely demise of S.W.R.D. Bandar Naika in 1959, Madam Sinimavu Bandar Naika was elected to the leadership of the party. The regime of Sirimavu Bandar Naika is regarded as an era that had strengthened local economy through introduction of a new agricultural policy. The government that came into power in 1977 had destroyed the progressive plans of the Bandar Naika government. However, destruction of the plans that had existed prior to 1977 is still being considered as a policy most appropriate to Sri Lanka. In the year 1994, Podhjana Eksat Perabuna, headed by Sri Lanka Freedom Party, had regained power. Ms. Chandrika Kumar Tunga was appointed as leader of the party in 2000. Mahindra Rajapaksha had assumed leadership of the party in 2005. The period of administration under the leadership of Mahindra Rajapaksha is being considered as the golden era of this LFP. The Mahindra Rajapaksha government has entered history as a regime which had ended 30 years of war and carried the country towards an era of development. 
It was also during the regime of Mahindra Rajapaksha that the longest administration period of an alliance headed by the SLFP had been recorded. Therefore, Maitri Palasi Reseda had assumed leadership of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party in 2015. It was under the leadership of Maitri Palasi Reseda that the Sri Lanka Freedom Party had entered into a national government with the United National Party for the first time in the history of the party. And meanwhile, prison officers have recovered a mobile phone in the possession of parliamentarian Rishad Badruddin, who is currently in remand custody. Prison's media spokesman Chandana Ekanayaka said that actions will be taken against parliamentarian Badruddin under the Prisons Act. Prisons media spokesman and prisons commissioner Chandan Ekanayaka said that suspect had thrown the phone out of the window of the prison cell where the chief jailer and another jailer had walked up to the respective cell. He said that the mobile phone has been handed over to the intelligence division for further investigation. Accordingly, he said that the relevant parliamentarian will be produced before a prison judge panel under the violation of the 87th provision of the Prisons Act. A new national policy is set to be introduced for the conservation of environmentally sensitive areas in the country. The formulation of the relevant draft bill has been spearheaded by the Ministry of Environment. The new national policy will be drafted with the assistance of the United Nations Development Programme in Sri Lanka with the funding from the Global Environment Facility. Speaking at a high-level forum to introduce the new policy and the way forward, Secretary to the Ministry of Environment, Dr. Anil Jasinga said that the new policy is set to address the need for dealing with the natural capital outside the formal protected area systems, which is key for the prosperity and future of the country by aligning the rightful owners for decision-making with regards to land. He further said that the contentious issues with land can be addressed while protecting the nature's bounties. Resident representative of UNDP, Robert Jokum, said that the new policy will ensure that communities are a part of economic growth without compromising environmental conservation. The relevant draft policy is set to be rolled out by November 2021 following the approval from the Cabinet of Ministers. And with that, we conclude tonight's news. Do it just tomorrow at the very same time. Stay safe. Have a pleasant night.